Well, hello, everybody. Uh, again, I'm saying hello to a camera. I wish I could see you, uh, but this is a way that we connect at the moment. And what, uh, the idea of uh, having these interviews, and Ramona will talk more about it in a moment, but um, we had a staff meeting and Father Brendan said, we need to do more for our people, you know, we need to... Um, keep connecting and uh, then Franca said I think that um, we should get someone to interview you leaders and we all went no no and she said yes yes <laughs> and uh, got it she got in touch with Ramona and um, <clears throat> so that's why we're here today we're the first one and Ramona will talk about that now for you Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone watching to the first of four interviews with Kathy Gottlipson, pastoral associate, Father Emmanuel Dikioko, resident priest from Nigeria, Reverend George Petchmet, deacon, and Father Brendan Lane, parish priest. For those who do not know me, I'm Ramona Dice, a fellow parishioner of St. Mary's. Each of our participants will be asked 20 questions. By sharing their experiences with us, we hope to get a better, perhaps even deeper understanding of the person behind the name. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get right to it. Today I'm speaking to Kathy, who needs no introduction. Kathy has been the Pastoral Associate of St. Mary's for the last five years. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. It's good to be here. So here mm -hmm. we go. What motivated you to become a Pastoral Associate? Well, um, I was a primary school teacher and I'd been teaching for oh, about 30 years or something when... Um, <clears throat> The school I was at at the time, St. Peter and Paul's in uh, East Doncaster, um, I was the REC, the Religious Education Coordinator, as well as classroom teacher. Uh, some paperwork came across my desk and it was to talking about um, a pastoral diploma. And I read about what entailed this course and I thought, ah, oh, I think I'd like to do that. So um, I studied that for four years while I was teaching and after the four years, and I might say that in the fourth year, part of my training was to do a mentoring program at a parish. And the parish that was chosen for me and my mentor was actually St. Mary's Dandenong wow. and Sister Margaret Fields, who I know a lot of you love dearly yes. and have good memories of. So I was actually working in this parish one day a week for uh, about 12 weeks, yeah, with Sister Margaret. Um, so I have been here before, <laughs> and that would have been in uh, 1999. Yes. Anyway, I did my uh, four years, and then I decided, yep, this is the work I want to do uh, in parishes. So I left teaching. I was given a position at St. Jude Scoresby, and uh, that's how I started, yeah. Very good. And we are lucky and very blessed to have you with us. Oh, thank you. I love being here. Okay. Do you know all of your parishioners by name? <laughs> no. No, I'm sorry, everyone out there. <laughs> I love to know you all by name. Um, of course, you know, I don't know how many families we have in the parish, it's probably up near 2,000. Um, and unfortunately, normally I'm at the two Sunday morning masses, not the evening masses, mm -hmm. uh, only because of the work I have to do at the morning ones. And so some of you may come to the evening masses and you might think, I never see Kathy. Um, so maybe that's something I need to look at too, to try and get more to every now and then an evening mass. 
Yes. But I think it's safe to say that you know most of us by name. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of you by name now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which gospel passage inspires you most and why? Aha. Uh-huh. So um, I was thinking about that question, and I actually have to say this too. One is a very personal reason, um, and I actually did uh, this story for my first gospel reflection, uh, and that is the woman with the hemorrhage. Um, and why that is so close to me is at a time when I was not very well at all. I used to draw from that gospel um, and I used to think if I could be like that woman and just touch Jesus' cloak um, and he'd turn and know me, you know, and cure me. This used to be on my mind all the time and uh, it, it's become a very personal gospel passage and... Um, it's very warming for me. Um, so that's one. But the other one, I've always loved the message. There are many rooms in my father's house. Mm-hmm. I've always loved that. And I know a lot of people have it at funerals because I thought, well, Jesus said that. And he says after that, if it were not so, I would have told you. Meaning, you know, if it was any different, I'd tell you it's different, buddy. So for me, that's very comforting. (laughs) It's beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. What's your favourite feast in the church's calendar? Uh Aha. Again, I had to think on this. I I believe for me it's Holy Thursday. And why I say Holy Thursday is just the the beautiful um, time of us, Jesus giving us his body and blood, and so it's, um, it's a moving time for him. It's a moving time for the disciples. Um, it's so important that he gave us that um, on that night when he was so sad. And uh, the fact, too, of washing the feet of the apostles there, so um, telling us to serve each other. I think it's a beautiful ceremony that we have on Holy Thursday night. Um, And for me, I I always get a lot of warmth and love out of that service, yeah. It's a beautiful legacy he left for us. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's lovely. Okay, so now we get into some interesting stuff. (laughs) If you were to act in one of the Below movies, and I'll give you the names of the movies, which would it be? And what role would you choose? Movie number one, Ten Commandments. Number two, Bernadette. Number three, Miracle of Fatima. And number four, Passion of Christ. Wow. <laughs> uh, when I, I sort of thought about those four movies, um, first of all, I thought Bernadette because as a child, I always love the story of St. Bernadette and I chose Bernadette for my confirmation name. But as an adult, I choose the passion and I choose the passion. I want to be one of those women who was there following Jesus Jesus in his suffering um, and, you know, just feeling with him, yeah, and being there for him. Yeah, I think that's that's what I would that's the one I would choose. Yeah. I can relate to that. Women who are not always well heard of or talked of in the gospels either. That's true, very true. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Have you ever had an occasion or reason to question God's existence? Yes, well. I think I might have come very close to it once as an adult. Um in a very, very hard time for me. But I felt I couldn't get near God, but I think I still knew he was there for me. And uh, when when a person feels like they're down a, a well or a tunnel in a tunnel um, and you don't feel like praying or talking to God, you know he's there. 
or I knew he was there, I should say. I knew he was there. Sometimes I'd just say, I can't talk to you, God. I can't talk to you. Um, so, yeah, I've never doubted he's there, I think. Yeah, I've always... I think we've all been through yeah. that sort of situation. Yes, and we still believe he's there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What's the first career you dreamed of having as a kid? <laughs> Teacher. <laughs> I used to get my dolls. I used to put them all in rows <laughs> on my bedroom floor. And I used to be the teacher. Ah. And I would really pay out on those dolls. <laughs> I actually thought it would have something to do with singing. No, no. Okay. No. Even though as a kid, I bought, yeah, I always loved singing. But no, I always wanted to be a teacher of little kids, of, of primary, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Who is your favourite Australian Prime Minister and why? Uh -huh. Or should I say, do you have a favourite Australian <laughs> Prime Minister? I have two Prime Ministers that, I've, that have been alive while I'm alive on this earth that I've been very proud of their leadership and that was John Howard when we had the massacre in Tasmania. You pulled out the massacre. Yeah. And I was very proud of the way... He did the gun control thing. I, 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 I was just so worried we'd finish up like the United States. Mm. And he took control of the whole situation yeah. and said, no, we're not going to be like that. Yeah. He had a good handle on things. Yeah. yeah. So I was proud of that decision mm. of him. And Scott Morrison, I was proud of the way he handled COVID as it first came in to our country, how he took the stand and all the time, um, he, uh, you felt, oh, I did. I felt like oh, he was on the journey with us. He was there with us and he was giving us a future path all the time. Um, so both those, in my lifetime, I felt have um, made very two very good leadership decisions. Yeah. What is the favourite book you've read to your children and grandchildren? Um, well, this book, it's actually a children's novel, so it's not like a little picture book. But, and I read it to my children in my class as well, and they loved it. My grandchildren loved it, or when they're old enough for me to say, you know. Um, and it's um, called Goodnight, Mr. Tom by Michelle Majorian. Um, this novel, it's been made into a film also, it's about a little boy in the time of uh, the Second World War in England and he, um, for those who don't know, uh, the government decided that children in London should be um, sent to families in the countryside for their own safety and so these children were just herded into trains with their names around them and sent to people they didn't know in the country who'd agreed to take a child for the duration of the war. And um, this little boy is malnourished. He's not been looked after at all. He's been beaten by his mother. He and... Uh, so, so like the foster mother? His own mother. His own mother. His own mother in London. But when he's on the train and he's sent uh, to an old man in the country who's a widower, and he doesn't want a little boy and he's told you're going to have one. And the love that grows between this little boy who's had no love and this man who's been closed up ever since his wife died. The little boy opens him up and he starts to bring love into this child's life and good health again. And, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's the setting of the story. It does get worse in part of it. Um, and uh, the children, their little hearts used to go out to him. <laughs> and I, lo I loved reading it to the children, yeah. Beautiful. It sounds like it, a Yeah, it's a good book if you want to have a, 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 a read, yeah. What is the best advice you have given to your family? Yeah, well, I think when I uh, thought about this one, um, probably... I always wanted my children to grow up to be independent and good 
um, adults. Uh, so, and I think that was part of my teaching in that too, that um, same when I taught children, I wanted them to, you know, to grow up with self-esteem and, and confidence in themselves and make their own decisions. And now at this age, I'm a bit sorry about that because they're so independent. They don't need me sometimes. <laughs> but um, yes, that's that's probably, and I see them doing that with their children, my grandchildren now. So yeah, I think. Yeah. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? <laughs> Well, as we all get older, we've been given lots of advice, haven't we, by people? Sometimes too much. <laughs> Sometimes yes. advice we don't want. Um, I think an auntie of mine and my mother too, who was mum's sister, both said to me, you know, they kept saying to me that people were important and, you know, if you're invited somewhere, you always go. If you're asked to do something, if you can, you always do. Uh, so, yes, you open up your heart and your mind to people. And I am a people's person. Um, I love people. I love being with people. And, and I've kind of taken on board that, Jess, that, uh, uh, you yeah, know, it's about people. It's not about yourself. Yeah. That is very sound advice. Thank you, Cathy. <laughs> Um, for what are you most grateful in your life? Uh, my faith, first, and my children and my grandchildren. So I have three children and ten grandchildren. Wow. And <laughs> that is nice. I'm very grateful that, uh, yeah, I have that, yeah. Besides singing, do you have a hidden talent? <laughs> well, um, before I sort of got really into the singing, I was always sporty. So really? uh, I played netball at a high level. I played netball for Victoria. Well, you've got the height, for sure, <laughs> yes. And um, I played practice matches against the Australian team and the New Zealand team, and netball my whole life, netball, netball, netball. <laughs> um, and at school, yeah, people say, oh, you're, you're good at sport. So, yeah, I was very into sport. And then tennis, um, played a fairly high level of tennis. Uh, so, yes, they, they're, they're the two things. So there you go, something we did not know about <laughs> Cathy. Yeah. Um, what would you sing at a karaoke sing-along? First of all, I, do you like karaoke? No. Okay. <laughs> but? But if you had to do a karaoke <laughs> sing-along, what would that song be? It would be Beautiful In My Eyes from Josh Caddison. Oh, yes. Josh Caddison. <laughs> I know the song. That is a favourite of mine too. Um, and I, if I, I've only sung a couple of times at a karaoke and that's what I've sung. Um, and it was a song I chose for my mother's funeral. And yes, so we had that song. Somebody sang it at mum's funeral. Oh, that, yeah. That is a very it good is. choice. Yeah. It's a lovely song, I yeah. think, yeah. Beautiful lyrics, yes. Yeah. Do you have a signature dish? <laughs> I love food, any food. Like, you know how people say, oh, I love seafood. I see food and I eat it. <laughs> So it's a different kind of seafood. <laughs> so, um, but I do love an antipasto platter um, or a ploughman's lunch, like the Aussies was the ploughman's mm -mm. with the um, cheese and the um, pickled onions and, and that. But, uh, yeah, any, a platter like that. Um, I love a really good risotto. Um, so... That's sort of perhaps the Italian side. Not that I've got Italian in me, but the Italian side of my <laughs> love of food. And um, but if you go Aussie, I love a rack of lamb with roast veggies and mint sauce. Yeah. And you you would prepare them all by yourself. Uh, risottos. I'm. I still can't do a proper risotto. Okay. 
Any pasta, you know, worries. Rack of lamb and roast veggies, yes. <laughs> then we know where to come <laughs> for a rack of lamb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you ever experienced a white Christmas? Uh, not particularly. I thought, oh, when I saw that question, I thought, oh, I haven't, no. But then I thought, well, sort of I have because I was in the United States uh, in November uh, in 2012, yep. And uh, my girlfriend and I, we were heading towards the Grand Canyon, but we were going to stop at a place called William, a little town in, and it started snowing. Mm. And uh, we went into the town to get a pizza for dinner, and it was snowing, and all the shops had their Christmas oh. lights on, yeah. and the street itself had little Christmas decorations. And I thought, oh, I'll never see this again, I'm sure, the snow and the Christmas decorations. So, but I, we, that wasn't Christmas oh, time. But, yeah, yes. but they were preparing. The setting was perfect. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it was lovely. Yeah. That's one of my dreams. Hopefully, I'll be able to have one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what's the most exciting city or country you have visited? Um, I'd have to say, for me, um, I've always, always wanted to go to France and I do speak a little bit of French. I've loved the French language since I was a kid at school. Um, so when I went to France, uh, I was a little bit disappointed in Paris, but um, I loved all the countryside of France, um, you know, the Loire Valley and then north up Normandy on the beaches and... Um, the Champagne area, um, the yeah, French Riviera. yeah, and, and and listening to people speaking French to each other. Oh, yes, it's beautiful. I, you know, for me, and having that champagne <laughs> <laughs> that I do love, um, yeah, for me that was a, a wonderful experience. But everywhere I've travelled and, and everywhere in Australia I've loved, yeah. I've never gone to a place and thought, I don't like this place, yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> we don't have long to go now. So, <laughs> if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, what would they be? I'm probably using what people have used for, for to describe me. So, sporty was always one. Even at this age, some people still think I'm sporty, but I don't get around very well. <laughs> and uh, smiley. People have always said, you're always smiling, so. And uh, my husband used to say, what's up with you? You're not smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't have to smile all the time, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so sporty and smiley. And um, a sort of, oh, God, what's the third one I was thinking about? It's hard to think about yourself like this. Um, to describe myself. I would hope I, I'm seen as a loving person. Yes. Yeah. And if I may add to that, very elegant. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's my perception of you, very oh, elegant. Thank yes. you. Okay. If you could invite four people, dead or alive, <laughs> for a meal to your home, who would they be and why? Wow. The first person who came to my mind was so easy, Jesus. I would love to have him at my house. Wouldn't be all. I would love to see him eating, drinking, laughing, talking. I would just, I would love that. So that was an easy one. Um, and I wouldn't bombard him with questions. I would just enjoy, just enjoy his watching life. him. <laughs> um, so Jesus for sure. Then I think another person is Lady Diana. Princess Diana. I don't know why, but I took an instant shine to her. And for all her, she was put through, I think she just shone out so beautifully. Um, I think as a shy girl first, she came on as we all saw her, and then the demands that were put on her um, and her loveless marriage her love of her two boys, and then her all her lovely work with people 
Um, I, I mentioned in one of my gospel reflections when she visited the hospital with yes, the, know. you know, the men with the AIDS, spirit, yeah. and she was touching their hands, which people weren't doing, um, and sitting and listening to them. And we all saw her go to the bomb place mm. and, and risked her own life by, I'm sure they made sure it was safe, but still, mm. she was in those fields and um, she took those risks. She took the risks mm. for other people and, uh, and, and, and sharing her own illness and her own sorrow, mm. her bulimia. Um, I, I thought she was a lovely lady, lovely lady. Oh, yes. definitely. Yeah. I did too. So that's two people. Two. <laughs> me, me two more, Cathy. Yes, okay. Um, another one would be, now when I had four, <laughs> Nathan Buckley, Collingwood um, of course. coach. <laughs> I'd have Nathan there because for all of you who don't know, I've barracked for Collingwood since I was eight years old and I, ha- I go to every game when we're allowed, not this year of course. <laughs> And I take my couple of my grandchildren. I've taken my three children to the football. I go with friends. It's a whole life for me. If I could have played football as a young girl, I would have. My mother said, well, you can't. So, <laughs> so I went to netball. <laughs> uh, but I would love to just listen to Nathan about how he works with the boys and um, yeah, just life inside the inside the hub, as it's called now. But yeah, um, and the lucky last, and the lucky last has gone out of my mind. Oh, no, it hasn't. No, no, this person I've loved since I was a little girl, and this is where my singing comes in. Doris Day. Oh, <laughs> crazy! Oh, I love Doris Day, <laughs> and I used to try and sing like her, and I mimed to all her songs. And then I loved all her silly movies with Rock Hudson as I was a teenager. Um, I love her voice. I love the way she sings. I loved her smile. Um, Even though when I read her book, she didn't really have such a happy life. But um, she always came across as a lovely, happy, smiley person, singing away so beautifully. And I believe she was a wonderful dancer when she was young. Uh, but she had a ski accident and oh, okay. yeah Didn't so then she turned to singing and uh yeah so Doris Day would be there so those four people I just sit and listen to them all day all night <laughs> perfect all right so we are now down to our last question if you could spend a day in someone else's shoes whose would they be and why Okay, this was a hard question. I thought, who would I want to be? Who? Um, because, yeah, my upbringing was always be yourself, be yourself, you know. And so, but then anyway, I've come up with a person who's really surprised me. I didn't think I'd ever, without thinking about it, I would never have come up with this mm-hmm. person. It's Ando. Oh, the painter. Yes, because I do like to draw and paint. I think he's so interesting, you know, as a refugee coming from Vietnam, to have this talent to paint people while he's talking to Mm. them like that, with the cameras all on him and the person in front chatting about Mm. their lives, him asking such interesting questions. I thought, wouldn't that be good to be him? And you could be, you know, to have that talent, to be painting away and meeting all these interesting people. Um, in your work, yeah. So I'd like to be armed over for a day. <laughs> Very lovely. So there you go, parishioners. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our first interview. Uh, the next one will be Father Emmanuel Di Kioko, and uh, we'll see you then. Until then, until next time, stay safe, and God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>